The digital bugs in Starship Troopers are still some of my favorite CG effects in film. I'm it's all about the direct connection between the puppeteer and the performance. Almost every single shot is entirely in camera. Wow, that, that, that actually, this is completely blowing my mind right this now. Is... Today's episode is brought to you by Keeps. Stick around to the end to get 50% off great hair loss prevention products and keep the hair that you have. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artists React. Today is an incredibly special episode because we're going to be looking at practical effects with none other than the practical master himself, Adam Savage. That's a lot to live up to. I mean, is it though? I don't know. I think it'd be pretty easy for you to live up to that one. I'm Adam Savage. Uh, I am a YouTuber, formerly a Mythbuster. Before that, I was a special effects uh, artist and, and model maker for 20 years. We are visual effects artists generally by trade, and so it's interesting to hear your perspectives on how these effects are created, but done for real. <laughs> I want to look at A Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, Frank Oz's film. How about that? You talked. You, you open your trap. You, you sing and you sing. Feed me, club on. Feed me now. <laughs> it's an unbelievable practical effect. There's like five, six, eight people operating all these parts of that plant to get this performance out. What I love about it, though, is the fact that they had to take special consideration with how they filmed it in order to make the movement seem natural. Right, do right. You know, There's, you know they're ramping the camera in one direction, right? Yes. So what they're doing is they're undercranking the camera a little bit so that they can compress those frames into a normal frame rate, speeding it up. They essentially played out the lines at a very slow speed so that all the, the puppet work and the model work of the, that mouth, because it's very articulate, yeah. but it's moving at speeds that something of that mass wouldn't be able to physically do. Right. What about the split screen where they're both in frame? Yeah, is that like all in the same take or is he like being composited somehow on top of that? That's a very good question because it turns out Rick Moranis is an excellent actor and was able to act in slow motion. He's acting well, in look, slow motion? Well, look, if Sting could dance in slow motion. <laughs> okay, <fair>. I'm sure. <laughs> and you can kind of tell when Rick Moranis is walking towards the door, he's walking slowly, so he's having to balance on each leg after every step he takes. So it kind of creates a little bit more of a wobble. <laughs> yeah. You know, because when, awesome. when you normally walk, you carry your momentum through your yeah, steps. Yeah, of course. I know Frank, I've like talked to Frank about making this film and he talks about the collaboration of all of these puppeteers getting this to work. It's mind blowing to me. There's so much going on. Each of the leaves, each of the branches has specific gestures that are timed to the script. I mean, they must have storyboarded this out like an animator beats out every frame of an animation. Um, I know from knowing Muppeteers that one of the axioms on Jim Henson's sets were you didn't stop until it was right. Like, literally, Jim had the power at the peak of his career. You just didn't stop until everyone was happy. I'm gonna go down to Spendrix and pick you up some nice chopped sirloin. Must be blood. I've been doing a lot of like face mocap and like trying to get like blend shapes of people talking digitally and stuff like that. And there's this thing called like visemes. When, when we talk, there's a like a, a set of visemes which basically define the lip shape of huh. every sound a mouth makes. And having a puppet that's able to actually like recreate those yes. because of the, the intricate lip motions. That's what really sells when something's talking. It's like subtle movements of the lips that you're just so accustomed to seeing, but if they're not recreated at that level of detail, it just looks like, you know, a ventriloquist oh, dummy oh, right. kind of just thing, the you mouth know? on a hand. Yeah. You know, although his head, carapace, his head looks like it's hard, it's very likely to be SRAM uh, foam rubber, like right? okay. the, the consistency of makeup sponge. Some people have a skin type. I have a certain kind of sweat that when I touch special effects foam rubber, I turn oh, it, it yellow. It? Oh, oh. I, I have what's hey. called piss hands in the oh industry. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was visiting down at Weta and they were showing me some castings. They were pulling out a foam rubber and I'm like, I can't touch it. I have piss hands. And I'm like, oh, stay away. Because <laughs> you really will turn it yellow if you start hey. to handle it. So I can't remember where this came out in relation to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is some of the best animatronics that's ever been put into a movie is in the second Ninja Turtles movie. Okay. And I know that actually that Henson's, uh, one of their animatronic controls was a specific mouse controller that allowed you to put all these hand gestures into the controller itself that would oh. translate out to the mouth. 
So it's not just someone going, I'm curling the top of the lip, I'm curling the bottom of the lip. It's more like they built a gestural controller. That makes sense, Which is more intuitive. Right, right. But I think you still had, on some of those puppets, two separate people using both their hands just to get the mouth to work. There's still a way in which Henson was prioritizing performance and prioritizing that direct connection between the puppeteer and the performance because that was their bread and butter, right? Like, like it's all about the translation from here to the script. Yeah. I mean, this, the Hades set is one of the great effect shots in film history. And this is, this is every model making technique there is. There's fiber optics, there's grain of wheat bulbs, there's transparencies with lights behind them, the flames coming off the building. Some of those were grabbed from the Antonioni film, Zabraski Point, and matted onto the buildings. All of the work in Blade Runner, every single effect shot, there's almost no process composite shots in Blade Runner. Almost every single shot is entirely in camera. Uh, uh, In order to do these in camera, what they're doing is exposing for shadows, exposing for environment, exposing for lights, blinky lights, building lights, the spinner moving. Every single one of those elements that I've listed is a separate motion control camera pass. Okay, yes. And because the motion control camera is, has 100% repeatability, mm-hmm. every single time you're just blacking out everything else. Okay, yeah. So when the flames come off the top of a building, they're literally, for that pass, they're just putting a white card over that building and projecting the flame on it frame by frame as the MoCo <laughs> pass is happening and then removing it. And because they're doing that one pass for that one exposure, nothing else gets exposed. Wait a minute. This isn't like five pieces of film that it's being created. No. It's Okay, so I, think I get it. No, I get it. I get yeah, it. Yeah. One piece of film, multiple exposures. For Star Wars, they also used motion control systems, and they would do separate passes of everything, but yeah. they would film them on different sets of film. Whereas in Blade Runner, all of these exposures are happening on the same piece of film in order to get the final shot. I mean, you can see how the flames are lighting up the building. You're right. I, <laughs> I never saw. I, didn't that. Think I never about noticed that. that. <laughs> wow. That, 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 actually, this is completely blowing my mind right this now. This is why this movie looks better than anything that has been produced since. Full stop. I yeah. will not even qualify. Well, that. that's because like when, when you're doing with multiple films, like there's that level of degradation that's happening, yeah. and you lose the, that fidelity. And you see it. You see it all the time when there's like early blue screen work happening yeah. or anything that requires a mat, basically. And in in camera passes, you are always a hundred percent getting the first pass onto the celluloid. And because we're dealing with film, it's purely just exposing the chemicals of the film itself. Right. How long is this shot? This shot is, let's say it's 10 seconds long. That's 240 frames. They're taking that piece of film and rewinding it past the gate, all 240 frames, and re-exposing every single one 25 separate times. Dang. When you lose a generation in compositing, the key thing you lose is the tiny aspects that communicate scale. And that's why these in-camera passes, I think, are just unbeatable. But it took 16 or 20 in-camera passes, each one of which took hours. So on this set, they're getting one of these shots per week. So the producers are like, yes, stop doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but look at it, though. No, I... But look at it. I know. Oh my God, this is, this is all really wonderful because the digital bugs in Starship Troopers are still some of my favorite heavy, heavy duty CG effects in film. I love these bugs. These bugs have also kind of like laid the foundation for the whole like alien bug aesthetic too. Yeah. Like you see them in video games a lot. They look just like this. Starship Troopers was, it was literally like the disaster everyone loves to talk about. Okay. Like if you worked on Starship Troopers, there, was, there used to be this, I don't want to name him, I'm going to call him Boozer, okay? Because I don't want to name and shame somebody from the past who could be watching this. Let's call him Boozer. There was a guy named Boozer who worked in special effects who was a total complainer. Okay. Like a real shit disturber and just like, why are you working so hard, man? The man is boning you. Don't work so hard. The crew hats for Star Trip Troopers say on the back, Boozer was right. (gasps) Yeah. Like that's the level that we're talking about. Oh my God. (laughs) What I love about Star Trip Troopers is it's, Phil Tippett's triumph after the shame and ignominy of, of Jurassic Park, frankly. Like, I, mm, I, I don't think he thinks yes. of it as a shameful episode, but like the, the fact that Phil was going to do the dinosaurs and then didn't do the dinosaurs was a really significant and rough hit. Like, yeah, and, absolutely. How could it not be? Also, uh, my, uh, a friend of mine said this years ago. He said, what's great about Starship Troopers is in any place where the script is absurd, the film 
basically holds its own script up for ridicule. I'm doing my part too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right? yeah. Like, this film is actually making fun of itself as it's going. And it was very much so underappreciated when it came out. Mm -hmm. I think people completely missed the, the satire of it yeah. and what it meant as like a theme. And people just kind of saw it as a superficial action flick. Yeah. And it's like, that's not what it was trying to be. It's afraid. It's afraid! <laughs> And now I've seen articles where like, it's just propaganda. And I'm like, it's anti-propaganda? <laughs> just get your terms straight. <laughs> Boy, that sure looks like a fun episode. I wish I could participate. But you know, if I go to quarterdigital.com and watch the extended cuts there, it's almost like I'm actually there. Check it out. You get all that deep inside baseball talk and extended stories from these amazing guests that have decided to join us. For only 399 pennies a month, you can subscribe and watch all of our stuff without ads. Plus we have a whole bunch of cool original shows, like Son of a Dungeon, lots of good stuff at quarterdigital.com. Check it out. Have fun, guys. <sighs> all right, well you get a load of this. Space Cowboys. I built this shuttle for that movie. It is the most detailed model of a shuttle that anyone's built for a film. We scratched every bloody tile. We got orthographic layouts of the tiles and scribed every tile line into that model. Because Clint is cheap in the best way. And he was like, no, 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 you only get to build one model for all of our effect shots. So for the scenes in which the shuttle is entering the Earth's atmosphere and you see the wing glowing, they literally took the wing and applied 3M scotch light material to the wing and shined a red light at it to get the glow. Oh, <laughs> right. I, okay. When Clint steps out of the airlock in this film into the payload bay, that's my model that he's walking around in. And like behind him, fills a movie screen and it's a 12 inch wide model. And Whoa. Then, like, when you're sitting in a theater and you're looking at a 70 foot wide screen and you know it's 12 inches of your hard earned labor, it was like seven months just working on that payload bay. Oh uh, we did a bunch of camera testing to figure out what gold foil to use. Oh. Because there's a lot of different golds. And for us, for our camera test, it was Rolo wrappers. So we bought cases of Rolos. And okay. so there was somebody, one model maker <laughs> spent, spent a day unwrapping hundreds of Rolos and making a stack of precious Rolo foil. So we're literally, like, we're looking there could at Rolo be wrappers. chocolate yep. underneath there. <laughs> There's just like a little chocolate bit of... chocolate residue, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny, because I've had that thought before, because it's like, you see, especially like the lunar lander with all that mm -hmm. gold foil there. And I remember unwrapping a Rolo and being like, this looks like the moon lander. So this shot we're seeing here then, that's a space suit, that's a guy on a blue no, screen, no, or is not. that it's a CG a guy? It's full CG. It's one of the, it's an, er yeah, it's early, so it's a full CG Clint. It looks good. It yeah. looks great. It looks really good. Yeah. I, that's the, I was looking at the feet and the shadows, and it's like, this is working for me. So that's a, I'm buying it. Middle, those little missiles there, uh -huh. those were, uh, I think we grabbed those off one of the Saturn V models. The large plastic model kit of the Saturn V from the 70s supplies tremendous amounts of ILM Greeblies. There's tons and tons and tons of pieces of that that show up all over the place. So within model making, we do a lot of kit bashing. And in kit bashing, you end up, each model maker ends up having certain things they like about certain types of kits to kit bash from. Mm -hmm. So the finest castings, the finest tools come from Hasegawa and Tamiya kits. Okay. Like they're just the most, the crispest little details. And so a lot of those, and specifically the military stuff, like the, the, the gun on a rail car, uh, the Flakwirling, has so many parts that are in every Star Wars model. And there is a piece that is jokingly referred to in the, in the model making industry as the Universal Gravely, because it, there is one on every single Star Wars ship in history. We used it in the miniature of this Russian satellite and then they built a full-size set to our model. So if you look down, that guy there is the Universal Greebly, and they made it like this big on the no set. No way! And okay. we were so excited. <laughs> we were like, oh my God, they built it! <laughs> and, and the reason that is the Universal Greebly is actually worth talking about, because we were talking about scale earlier. What the Universal Greebly is, is it's like a dome with four pips in the corners. Mm -hmm. And because it's a dome, it kicks light. From any direction. From any direction at any scale. So the Universal Greedly works at any scale because it always makes a little pinpoint light kick. Okay. Wow. It's the Wilhelm scream of model making. <laughs> Whoa, okay. There okay. you go. Okay. Right. There you go. I, I can't believe it's taken me this long in my life to say that. Adam Savage, a master of special effects, an absolute gem. 
But visual and special effects, no matter how good they are, they cannot affect things in this world, in reality. But what if I told you that there was a product, that there was a today's sponsor who could affect things in the real world like a VFX plugin for your hair? You might not know this, but two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. What keeps us here to do something about it? They offer a wonderful subscription service. A licensed doctor reviews your information online, makes a recommendation that's treatment just for you, and then that treatment arrives at your door every three months. Keeps is more affordable than many of the other competitors because they offer generic versions of already approved FDA drugs. Keeps treatments typically take between four to six months before you start seeing results, but that's why you need to start today if you're experiencing male pattern baldness. Prevention is the key. The easiest way to prevent hair loss is to keep the hair that you currently have. Keeps offers great online tools so you can be in 24 seven contact with your doctor, ask them any questions you have along the way, and with their Keeps progress tracker, you can keep track of your progress along the way. Now, if that's not enough, I'm gonna give you 50% off right now, okay? Go to keeps.com slash corridor crew or click the link in the description and that's exactly what you'll get. 50% off by going to keeps.com slash corridor crew. Okay, thanks for listening to my story and now back to the episode. My mind is blown. I'm <laughs> overloaded with awesome information and I'm excited to do even more. So Adam, thank you so much for coming to visit us here at the studio and do this with us. It, your knowledge on this is so insightful and like it's it's pulling back that curtain of, of, of mystery. I'm so yeah. glad to hear it. I tell you, after one of these things, I tend to go over the conversation in my head. I wanna make sure I got all my terms right, but really also that like, I know all the people that work on this stuff and I wanna do right by them. I wanna make sure I didn't tell the story wrong yeah. or overly, you know, whatever. I, I just like, I, I, I love talking about this. My whole life is about this conversation. And if you're not watching Adam's channel, Tested, you should be. It's amazing. There's so much, so much cool stuff on there. Go check it out right now. Well, thanks again, Adam. Um, we will get you back on the couch soon, but also ideally for a different kind of collab at some point soon. We gotta figure something out. 100%. Yeah. I'm in.